They talked about wartime exposure and battlefield exposure, but they talked more about military sexual abuse, military sexual trauma. And it seems as if quite a few of these did suffer this. I haven't put myself back together yet, and so any little thing probably, you're just waiting for the bomb to hit. You read about all the horror stories of, of everyone else. You're waiting to be that next statistic that's going to crack and just go crazy. My life was horrible. I up and down spiral, mood swings, nightmares, constant nightmares. Um, Bad anxiety problems. Couldn't keep a job. Couldn't work with men. I just it creeped me out. My bedroom is as weird as it sounds, off limits to me. I tend to sleep on the couch because I don't feel safe in my bedroom. If that makes sense. I understand it may not make sense to people. That's just, it's in my head. My doctor said I'm okay. It, it makes sense to her. Women um, in the past in the military, well, they weren't really uh, deployed in any numbers in any other role than in healthcare until you know, the um, Desert Storm. They're driving trucks into combat. They're um, mechanics, they're flying uh, helicopters. They're certainly exposed to wartime um, tragedies and disasters and, you know, uh, terrible injuries and death and seeing children die. And I think that's where a lot of PTSD comes from. A lot of people don't know, you know, did I, did I do something wrong? Am I a sinner? Am I, you know, the one that should be shameful or am I the hero? The best example I can think of is watching a horror movie that you're part of and it will reappear and replay at any time of day or night out of the blue for the rest of your life. For a majority of my high school and college life, it was all about me, 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 me. I did everything um, that I could to excel just for myself. I thought about it one night, I went to go visit my mom, and I was like, Mom, guess what? She's like, what, you're gonna join the military? <laughs> it was kind of funny, and I laughed, and I said, yeah, I think so. I went to the recruiter. I was like, I don't care where I go. I don't care what I do, I just wanna go. And um, probably should have researched a little bit more. My whole family is military. Um, it was something that I felt that was an honor to do. In boot camp, I was a baby. Everyone, it was like a big family and I was the baby of the family and everybody helped me so I can make it through boot camp because of my age and my being so naive and not knowing how to do a lot of things. Appearing on to the ship and meeting these people, it was like, oh, okay, you know, this is what life is gonna be like. You know, these people are gonna be my family. I told my mom when I was in fourth grade that I was joining the Air Force. Uh, there was nothing that I could really find in Rochester that really seemed appealing to me. And my uncle was in the service and he made it sound awesome. I have pictures of him in Japan where I was eventually stationed. So I thought that was really cool. And I've always wanted to. I saw it as a chance to see the world, to get a decent education, and to make some memories. I would occasionally get phone calls and a woman would say, I, hear, I heard you're interested in women's health and women veterans. I'm not gonna tell you my name, but let me tell you my story. 
These are all anecdotes. We hear reports of uh, superior officers uh, raping and, and enslaving, sexually enslaving women in the military. Some people give estimates of about 30% of women are uh, assaulted and raped and often gang raped in the military. There's a lot of male attention overseas, a lot of male attention. Um, it's hard not to go anywhere overseas and not get male attention, whether that was in Iraq or Korea. And the problem with being in the military is you can't run from your problems. You know, you're, you're constricted to a 100 mile radius. You know, you live, work, eat, sleep with these people. You know, I'm 40 years old. This happened when I was 17 and 18. I've had a horrible life. We need to listen to the stories because the stories are very compelling and really heartbreaking sometimes. I showed up on board and was told that I didn't have to technically be on board because it was a holiday weekend until that Tuesday because there was nobody in there to log me in and so they took me to a place where I could put my uh, sea bag and a group of gentlemen, fellow shipmates, said that since I had no place to go, I can come hang out with them. They were going down to New York City and they were going to hang out there for the weekend and that I was more than welcome to come with them, so that's what I chose to do. Now, I was 17 and having older people want you to hang out with them is always as a 17 year old, it's cool. It makes you feel like, you know, all right, you know, you're the man. Ended up doing some mixed drinks and that there, and I somehow passed out. I don't know why, because not like I was a drunk at the time, but I ended up passing out. And I woke up with a gentleman standing above me masturbating, and another person was pulling my pants off with his clothes off and it, it freaked me out. I got right up, ran into the bathroom, and I just kept washing my face. I, you know, I, I, I've never experienced this. I didn't know what to do. And they kept knocking on the door, oh, we're only playing with you, it's a joke, we're initiating you. This is what we do to all the new people. And I was creeped out. I stayed in the, for a couple hours in the bathroom. Finally, they talked me out. I stayed awake the rest of the night. And I left first thing in the morning and I got on a bus and took a bus back to the ship, reported exactly what happened, and they told me I was a liar. I just wanted to go back home. I was a mama's boy. And I kept, you know, went from person to person trying to get someone to listen to me and nobody would listen. This is a family. You don't do this to your family members. This is inexcusable and it really wrenches at our guts when we have these kind of individuals engaging in this kind of criminal behavior. About a year ago I saw, in Ms. Magazine, I saw a little blurb just announcing that this lawsuit was going to be filed against the Department of Defense related to their the epidemic of rape in the military. I got in touch with the attorney and I got in touch with people working with her and then through that got in touch with some women who had been victims of this and then that led to, it opened sort of Pandora's box. There's a lack of will. There's a lack of political will on the part of the leadership of the military. You know, if you think about the military's job and military readiness, they, they should have tackled this years ago. We have a problem, we have a significant problem. We have about only 14% of the people that have been sexually assaulted to come forward and say they have been sexually assaulted and because it's one of the most underreported crimes we have in the military and in the civilian sector, I think it's safe to assume that there's probably about five times more than that that have come forward every year than were reported. It is something that leadership in the Army takes very seriously. Uh, one rape uh, is, is too many. We're actually encouraging people to, to, to uh, to respond and to report cases to us. And so I think that the, the increase, the semen increase in numbers is just the, uh, the result or an outproduct 
of the reduction of stigma of reporting these kinds of incidents within our service. And so I, I would tell you that I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, couch it as an epidemic uh, just based on the, the numbers that have happened, but it is a, it is a problem. And, it's, and we have uh, taken tremendous efforts to counter that. We were very fortunate here in the College of Nursing to receive a very significant grant from the Department of the Army. So we designed a study as part of the Restore Lives Center here at the College of Nursing to study the health of women veterans. Over time, the stress response becomes not helpful but deleterious and leads to certain diseases. And these are the sort of classical midlife diseases of women obesity, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and sometimes depression. I think we're done. I don't want to pull it out. They need to talk. They need to have assistance in dealing with their stress issues. Some of these women were clearly extremely distressed. Others appeared not so stressed until they began to talk, and then they would tear up. And they talked about um, wartime exposure and battlefield exposure, but they talked more about military sexual abuse, military sexual trauma. And it seems as if quite a few of these women did suffer this. I was an aircraft mechanic. There aren't a lot of females in that career field. Um, I was actually the only one in my flight, even at home station. While I was stationed in Saudi Arabia, um, there were people, obviously, planes rotated in and rotated out on a constant basis. We all went, we were playing Phase 10, which was a game that we all started playing there for some retarded reason, but every other night we were all playing Phase 10. So I'd go into the bathroom not thinking anything of it. These are guys that I've hung out with for, you know, the entire three weeks that they were there. And they were actually getting ready to leave. And, not even in days. And on my way back out, one of the guys stops me and I'm like, what? He goes, oh, I just wanted to show you, you know, some of the stuff that we just got and da 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 da. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So we're standing there and we're, I'm looking at some of the stuff that he got, some of the stuff that he's taken home to his wife and who he should see in, you know, days. I said, well, I gotta go. I said, we gotta get up, we got work tomorrow, da 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 da. No, 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 no. And he blocks the door. And I'm like, you know, move, come on, stop joking around, da, da 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 I'm like, I'm not staying in here. I said, the guys are in the other room. I'm headed back out that way, and then I'm going home. It is a big guy, strong guy. I, I never made it out, but um, he raped me. Um, kind of left me with a couple of diseases. I ended up going to the doctor after a while just because I'm like, okay, it hurts when I pee, this hurts, that hurts. I went back to the States, uh, gosh, three weeks later, I was on my way back. So I left and unfortunately, when I got back, it was, oh, Lori's a whore, Lori did this, Lori did that, and Lori's like, Lori didn't do anything. Who was saying that? Um, some of the guys I work with. And I'm like, uh, no. It wasn't me, it wasn't like that. Um, but I didn't, I didn't say he raped me. I never told anyone um, at that level what had happened. I think it swept under the rug. I think that a lot of females that were to come out and say, well, Sergeant so-and-so did this to me, or Sergeant so-and-so did that to me. It's not really, it's not as punishable as, as if they were to get caught with a DUI. No one in their company wants to acknowledge that, yes, this happens. Um, so I think it, a lot of it is just kept quiet. It's, it may be dealt with saying, did you do this? No, I didn't do it. it it's like, he said, she said. I've never seen any stern action taken against it. I was sodomized. I had people trying to rape me. I constant beat, constant robbed. You know, I'd come in there bloody and beat up and they tell me I was a liar and did it to myself. 
and I just wanted out of the military. And that's what I dealt with. Every single time the ship was getting ready to leave port, I knew that if I was on that ship, I had nowhere to go. So I would go AWOL just to avoid being raped. And it got to the point where these guys were getting so upset and, and having so much fun with this that the um, time I was taking a shower, they yanked me out of the shower, beat me down, and you know, you gotta understand, I was 17 years old. I weighed about 130 pounds. This is me at 17 right before I went in. And I fought, but against three guys, there's only so much fighting you can do. And they beat, literally beat me up, put me to the ground, shoved a toilet brush cleaner handle up in me and raped me with it repeatedly until they got bored with it and then left me there. And I put my clothes on, went to the doctors, reported it to the infirmary, and they told me, well, you probably got hemorrhoids, and it's from sitting or something. Take the rest of the day off, use this preparation H, and you'll be fine. Then you keep have to seeing these people, and, and they go on with their daily life like nothing ever happened. And, you're left with the void of what just happened to you and, and no justice for it. Uh, actually, I've never heard of someone going to jail for rape in the military. Honestly, I haven't. I've seen cases that court-martial, punitive discharge, imprisonment, down to, let's say, a wrongful sexual contact, the groping, where a commander could give what's called an Article 15, which is a military justice option, uh, where it uh, does maybe not rise to the level of a court-martial. But as a commander, I have had Article 15s where I have used them, where I have demoted people, I have fined them, and I have used that as the trigger to remove them from the Air Force. female that I saw spoke up um, was actually reprimanded for it. No one believed her. So she's the one that lost rank and was put on extra duty. I saw the, the female get the Article 15. I remember when I was going through training, <laughs> that's the thing, we always had to have a battle buddy with us at all times. Even when talking to um, our leaders because sometimes things happen when you're by yourself and you're talking to someone who's uh, your NCO and it's always good to have that extra person there just in case as a witness and that's sad to say but you know that's what they they told us. We have a campaign that that started a couple of years ago called the I Am Strong campaign and I Am Strong uh, is is intervene, act, and motivate. No means no, no means no, no means no. I think that uh, we've, we've started a pretty aggressive program in 2008, uh, which is our sexual harassment and assault response program. And as a result of it and a campaign that we've had to get the word out, uh, I think we've had uh, more people uh, report incidents uh, of rape or sexual harassment and the like. And so I think that, that uh, it's been there, but it's just now coming to light. And we have a, an anti-stigma campaign that's going on that's making it uh, easier for people uh, to report. Some of the services uh, do just mass briefings. Many of them break down in small groups and they find that's what's most effective when it's scenario-based, interactive, when they have an opportunity to ask questions and really understand, like, this is what sexual assault is. How would you bring your fellow airman, soldier, sailor, and marine out of a bad situation? What would you do? Where would you go? Hey, check out Chris, he's making a fool of himself. Dude, that girl's trying to leave and he keeps grabbing her. Man, that's all we need is get put on lockdown again. Yeah. Tracy, look, that guy is all over Mindy. What is his deal? What a jerk. No wonder the locals want us out of here. 
Oh, wow. He's not taking no for an answer. It looks like things are getting out of hand. Come on, let's get her away from here. And we better go get him before he does something stupid. You want to walk, it, walk them through that, and not just one time, but many times, throughout basic training, throughout their technical training, and when they get into their first unit and even beyond. So, I mean, there's just a complete lack of, uh, of, of wisdom around this issue. The, uh, some of the, I don't know whether you've seen them, but some of the posters and the public service announcements that they have promulgated, they, they almost portray it as if most men are rapists, which is not the case. In fact, there's a very small number of criminals who are in the military who need to be stopped and convicted. But the, the, the military's approach to it is basically like, well, everyone's a rapist if a woman is drunk. I mean, it's a very, if I were a man in the military, I would be completely offended by the way they've approached rape prevention. All right, good night. You walking back alone? Yeah, it's just a short walk to my chew. All right. Hey, what's up, Sexy? How you doing? What's your name? Hey, stop. Hey, stop. Hey, come here. Come here. Let me talk to you for a sec. I just, I just want to talk to you. Oh, hey. are you okay? No, there's this guy. He grabbed me. Why are you by yourself? Where's your buddy? I didn't think I needed one. Sexual assault is preventable. Are you doing your part? I mean, you know, give me a break. <laughs> They'll give you the mental help. It's free free psychological services, but as far as disability, um, which is really what a lot of females look for because that's their only restitution. You know, I couldn't punish him back then, so maybe can I get some monetary value out of it? We heard loud and clear from many of our veterans that, you know, I was sexually assaulted 10 years ago, but the military has no record of it. We didn't maintain those documents. Every service had a different retention record, so we standardized that. So now, 50 years for anybody that files an unrestricted report and five years for those that file restricted reports. A soldier can either go through a restricted process, which is very limited knowledge, those who know about it, the case is not prosecuted, or they can go through an unrestricted process where they'll inform the SARC within the unit, the uh, sexual assault response coordinator, who will, respond, who will let the victim advocate know, who will respond to the senior mission commander on that particular installation. And the case will be reviewed by the committee that meets the sexual assault committee at that particular installation. I've certainly seen cases where, you know, every, everything had been taken care of, there had been an investigation done, there were, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, diagnoses lined up, including VA treating physicians. There's no consequence to, you know, if a, via, you know, somebody at, at the lowest level of reviewing the claims, just in spite of all of that evidence says, no, you didn't prove it. The people who are, you know, kind of screening for eligibility on the front lines almost act as though it's coming out of their pockets. So there's a certain pride that people take in kind of guarding the public fisc. I began to research the subject and I was really appalled when I found out not just the rate of the rapes and sexual assault but the dismal conviction rate just dismal a survivor in our case who her, who she herself was a criminal investigative division agent for the military right so she's one of the people that does the investigating when she herself was raped she didn't report it because she knew that there is no real investigation they just they just laugh at it they don't take the victim seriously they act as if the fact that there's not eyewitnesses means it can't be investigated and prosecuted I mean this notion of he said she said well there's no eyewitnesses so we're gonna let it drop that's ridiculous. It's hard to prove. The military still wants you to prove it. Why didn't you say it back then? It's almost like you would have had to have it on tape. In a sense, what the military is sending a message by the way they treat this is that somehow they have a disproportionate number of liars among the women in the service compared to civilians. That's, that's absurd. I don't think that the military wants to accept that that's a problem. 
right now. It's almost like, you know, we're at war with, with several countries and if we were to admit that we have a severe problem amongst our ranks, it almost makes us seem weak. So I don't think that that wants to become public knowledge just yet. I have heard from people who are currently in the military that they will not reveal because they will not um, be listened to and they will in fact be punished. That hurts me when I hear that because uh, I'll tell you right now, um, the secretary has given me $9 million for the next fight up just for robusting our training for investigators and our lawyers. We think we have found the best possible course to send our investigators and lawyers, not just one, but both of them, down at the military police school. Uh, too often, uh, these cases go unreported. Uh, My boss, when I got back home, he asked me what was going on because he said, you seem different. And I finally told him what happened. And instead of saying, holy crap, let's go find, you know, the first sergeant, let's go do this, let's go do that, let's go do that, his, his words to me were, well, I guess you're a willing participant. And later on, he was, he did something and I said, stop, you're too close. And he goes, yeah, yeah, you like it that way, or some crap like that, he said. And he kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And then he told me, he goes, well, I think I should get a little of what he got. And I said, what are you talking about? I am back on American soil. I should be fine. I should be OK, right? No. He said, I'm writing your EPR now. So this is what I want. And unless you want to get a crappy EPR, this is what I'm suggesting you do. In the Air Force, how we get promoted. If you get a crappy EPR, you'll be stuck. There's a lot more men with higher rank than there are females. Um, so it can happen amongst your teammates, your platoon members, um, your chain of command. If you are assaulted by your commander, you should be able to change companies. You know, um, not have to kind of, or, or even change posts. That, I would say, was a valid complaint up to December when we initiated our expedited transfer policy. And that was another reason why we did this, to get more people to come forward. Uh, if you are in an organization and you've been a victim of sexual assault and you made an unrestricted report, you can go to your commander and say, I can't, be, I can't stay here. This is just untenable for me. I can't stand to be in this unit. Uh, and that commander's got 72 hours to say yes or no to your request to be transferred out of the unit or even off of that installation. The betrayal after the rape is as bad because, you know, here they are in the service where they're taught camaraderie, they're, they're you know, taught to view themselves as brother and sisters in arms, and yet when they're raped and they go to report it in, they bring it forward to their command, their careers suffer. We've gone through great lengths to ensure that the victim is not victimized uh, twice. And so we do uh, uh, take great care in ensuring that, that that their needs and desires are, are catered to. The problem here is that, you know, you're responsible for your unit, so you're responsible for your unit's cohesion. If you can't handle that problem, then that becomes your, it reflects badly on you as the leader, right? So a lot of people who are in charge, you have an, there's actually an incentive to make it go away, to sweep it under the rug, to, um, you know, ignore people's complaints because then that makes you look better, makes your unit look better. If a commander is sweeping this under the carpet or not addressing this, that is a violation of our policy and that commander should be relieved of command. The issue of uh, process and how long it takes, uh, that's, that's situational based on the, the evidence that's, that's available. It was either I was going to kill myself one way or another, or I had to leave. So I called my family, and they told me, you know, to come home. Let's, you know, come home. We'll see what we can do. And so that's what I came home, 
and I met with a Congressman Sherwood Bowler out of Utica and told him my story and he says don't go back until I tell you you can go back you know try to stay out he says you know I'm not supposed to tell you this type of stuff but you know for your own safety don't go back and he did an investigation on it and while he was doing an investigation I was hiding out on the streets because I didn't want my family getting in trouble I ended up getting arrested and put in jail and waiting to get transferred back to the military and while I was gone two of the guys got caught raping another person of the six people that were attacking me. See, the guy was investigated twice, 87 and 88, for homosexual behavior. Their belief is that because of my age and that I didn't, you know, his feminine mannerism, I was confused. I think men have a lot just a much more difficult time with it because there isn't that and they live with the sense that it's their, they brought it on themselves. Um, a lot of them go into periods of deep depression and thinking that, you know, and, and questioning their own sexuality as well. Um, and I, I just don't have quite the same, you know, sort of skills or equipment to, to move on from it. I went to the brig and the brig asked me why I went AWOL. I told them why I went AWOL. Within 24 hours, I was released out of the brig. They told me I didn't belong at the brig. And they sent me back to the ship. And things were worse when I got back. Because now I'm known as the rat, the, the you know, the tattletale. And I didn't get in trouble for being AWOL because the command knew why I was AWOL and that they, oh, anytime anything happens, come and tell us, we'll protect you. But every single time something happened, I went and told them they didn't believe me. And there was no protection at all because I had almost thrown off the back of the ship, the fantail. It's well known, it's been documented that good, strong, leaders, commanders in the military who draw a line markedly will reduce the incidence of sexual assault in the military. He came to me because he said he could tell that there was something wrong. And when I finally did tell him what was going on, he used that information against me. He would touch me in public and then eventually we're at this 4th of July picnic and He had arrived there with his wife and his brother, who was Army. He goes, I need you to get me and my brother a ride home. And I'm like, well, where's your wife? Wasn't she just here? Now she had to go home, take care of the kids, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, I don't even know where you live. I'll show you. But I had stuff at my apartment that I needed to get. So I'm like, no, because I still got to go back to my apartment before I can go back on base. Oh, we'll just ride along. I said, whatever, fine. So we drive out to my apartment. I go, I said, okay, I'm just gonna run upstairs. No, I wanna see where you live. He goes, I'm your supervisor, I should know where you live. I went in my bedroom, grabbed a bag, started packing the stuff I would need to take with me, you know, to get to work, to get ready for work so I wouldn't have to go get anything else. And I was in my closet reaching for something. And you know how you can feel someone behind you? I turn around, he's, he's right here, he's touching me and I'm like, go away you know what are you doing i said go back and finish your soda i'll be done in five seconds he goes no you won't and he pushed me on the bed and he started taking my clothes off and i'm like stop it your brother's in the next room you know my roommate should be home any second stop i screamed no one came i'm like why is his brother not coming in here to help me well his brother was in on it too um I was relatively defenseless. It was just me and two guys. And one guy's this big army guy and one guy's big for Air Force guy, this big Air Force guy. So they both took their turns and did whatever. And they're like, okay, fine, take us home now. And I'm like, seriously? So I took them back to their house. I went back to my dorm room and I showed back up at work Monday morning and I did my job. 
I mean, some of the stories are just phenomenal. It's, you know, women having to salute their rapists every single morning or submit to, like, full-body um, checks or serve coffee. They want to do this for their lives. Or they want to go to college with it. They have these sort of, you know, really admirable, noble goals associated with it. And then what happens is they are then assaulted, have no recourse, or frequently diagnosed as having a personality disorder and then dishonorably discharged, then they have to live with that on their record. They don't get the benefits that they're supposed to. They often don't get the college credits or like, you know, the college funds that they were supposed to. It's just, um, yeah, and they never, that's not what they signed up for. The system is so dysfunctional that they are not getting the, the, the rights to due process, to equal protection that you and I as civilians enjoy. So we filed what's called a Bivens action, which is basically uh, saying, okay, the officials in charge uh, deprive them of their constitutional rights. And we named Rumsfeld and Gates, both of whom oversaw the military without any real reform on this issue. We have now gone through the district court process and we lost at that level, so we're appealing it to the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. The real issue is that there's this Supreme Court ruling from 1950 called the Ferris Doctrine that prevents anybody from suing the military for any kind of injury that, was, that happened to them when they were on active duty. We could do it. To my mind, it was that judicial act some years ago in the 1950s that has been part of the problem here. Because if you go back in time and you think of having uh, women and men who were harassed and assaulted in the military, had they been suing this in the same fashion as you saw women who were sexually harassed in the private workplace, I think it would have that we wouldn't have the problems we have today. If they are an active duty soldier when it happened, they can, you cannot hold the military accountable. And it's been tested a bunch of times and it's quite strong. There are some controlling Supreme Court precedents that, that can logically be read to preclude us from going forward. There's a, a, an older case in which the Army gave the soldiers LSD told, without their consent, the and the Supreme Court said, the no, you can't, have, you can't sue for damages for they that. They came in to give me the injection, they told me they was going to give me this injection. I, uh, I questioned it. What is this for? They don't want to lose it, and that's because, you know, their fear is that if, if it gets cracked at all. The next, the extreme of that is having a soldier on the battlefield turning to his commander and saying, no, I'm not gonna do what you asked me to do. I think you're wrong, I'll sue you later. Military sexual trauma seems to be increasing in the current conflicts over other war uh, experiences. Some people have suggested that it's related to the the way the military houses individuals. Um, some people talk about power relationships in su between superior officers and troops. There are men, just like there are women, who are insecure. And those are the men I think you have to watch out for <laughs> because they will need to prove to you that, how big and powerful they are. All I can see is men that did it are sick and twisted because I, I, you know, I, everything I've heard from all the rape victims that I've met is they didn't ask for it. They, they, you know, just because I go out and have a drink with somebody doesn't mean that means I'm having sex with you. There's a lot of um, demoralization um, for people that don't think that they might not live to see tomorrow. It, they live in the moment. You know, and so um, there's a lot of adultery that goes on. There's just a lot of, a lot of kind of crazy, chaotic um, things that you really wouldn't see in day-to-day -day society. There is not a culture of, of rape and assault within the military. Uh, uh, it's just the opposite. It's a value-rich, value-laden organization. And, uh, and when we find uh, situations, our folk who are outliers within our service, 
uh, our system, our legal system, takes corrective action, and we hold those people accountable. We have an all-volunteer army, and we're stretched too thin, and that nowadays they keep people. I had a patient who was schizophrenic. She had psychotic episodes every so often, intermittently, and I talked to her commander, and I explained that this, did he understand the medicine that this woman was taking and why she was taking it, and or what her symptoms were, and she was sent to Iraq with a gun. Over half our forces are taking psychiatric medicines, several at a time, not just one. They are so depleted, so exhausted from multiple deployments and from deployments that last a year and a half at a time. They're just, there's nothing left of them and they have to go back and they couldn't do that without these psychiatric medicines. But the same thing with PTSD, you know, they know a lot of soldiers are coming back with that problem. And in your desensitizing, they, they want you to raise your hand to say, who thinks they have a problem? Well, no one's going to sit there and raise their hand in front of a whole slew of 200 people and say, okay, well, yeah, I'm one. You know, I mean, they take on the wrong approach. Um, they need to get a little smarter in their strategies as to how, how to help these soldiers. I think that people are far away from home so they don't have the support system um, that they do in America with their family and their close friends and they're in a foreign country so I think maybe they feel lonely and they try to look uh, have um, find a different outlet for whatever they're feeling. If I went out with a group of people that I casually know I might have a drink or two but I never got drunk because I don't trust it. Too many things happen. Too many things happen all the time and it's just scary, and I know I don't want to be that female that it happened to. I think that alcohol really is one of those central uh, situations that it, it erases inhibition. Uh, I would tell you, though, that tolerance is not a part of the why it occurs. Uh, at the end of the day, I think sometimes individual has a choice, and, and we can't, we certainly cannot control what actions an individual might take there's a lot of issues we have to deal with in Iraq, like combat stress, family separation, but the one thing no service member should ever have to put up with is sexual assault. Sexual assault is a crime no matter where you are. There's no excuse for it. If you commit sexual assault, you discredit yourself and the military. Don't let a few moments of bad judgment ruin your career. And your life. We are duty bound to prevent sexual assault. Are you doing your part? Um, I had an NCO and she was, um, at the time I was just a PFC, a private, and she would talk to us. She liked to bring all the female soldiers t together and just sort of mentor us and she just made us aware. If I were to counsel a, a, new, a younger female going into military, I would definitely want them to do their homework. Kind of take their time and decide whether or not they really wanted to do this, whether or not they were strong enough to face all the challenges that they, you know, that the military brings on. Well, America uh, gives its services, their sons and their daughters, their husbands and their wives, their, their uh, nephews and their nieces. Uh, we have a, a tremendous responsibility to, to hold that treasure, to shape and nurture that treasure that America gives us, that America entrusts us with. Um, I know I used to talk to young women when they are first coming in. Look, I know you think Billy Joe Jim Bob thinks you're the hottest thing that just walked off this planet, but all he wants is in your panties. I was very upfront with the girls that walked in. So I'm gonna need you to pull up your big girl panties and let's go get to work. So some of them took it, some of them didn't. Me personally, I was very outgoing. Look, this is what they're gonna try and do. This is what they're gonna say. I'll tell you right now, this one right here has a little pole he puts little notches on, literally. You know how they always made that joke about, you know, notches on a headboard? He had this long, like, walking stick that he used to have notches on. And he used to try and put initials next to him to say, well, okay, this was this one, this one. Seriously? And my name was on there, and I never slept with him, so I know half of it's a lie. The other thing that we know about women veterans is that they, to some degree, some of them, are already vulnerable when they join military service. 
I think that anyone who feels like you've been victimized before, that you're a magnet for it. Um, it almost becomes like a scarlet letter. Um, you feel like everyone can see it uh, because it it just it, it just seeps from you. There's no you feel like that's all you think about, and you feel like everyone else can see it on you. So. That's kind of where the PTSD comes in, is that you keep thinking it's gonna to happen to you again, um, that you're just a target. Well, there's a certain vulnerable phenotype. <laughs> um, if a, a person has been abused once, in general, they're more likely to be abused again and again and again. Well, I think that's again a kind of blame the victim mentality. I mean, the reality is, you know, there there is a there's a prevalence of rape and sexual assault. I read in the, I think it was in the New York Times the other day, or maybe the Washington Post, that one in five women have been raped or sexually assaulted in their lifetime. That does not mean that they are a target. Um, and the same way you wouldn't say, well, if you've been mugged before, you're just asking for a mugging. Of course not. If you, are, you've, if you have the bad fortune to be a victim of a crime, it has no bearing whether you then are victimized again by a separate criminal. There's no connection there. One of the things I've learned in the service is you could put a uniform on some person that does not make them righteous. So I could tell you all day long not to do something. But if that's what you want to do, and that's what you think you have the right to do, then you're going to do it. The military is a microcosm of our society writ large, and so uh, kids who come to the military are coming from all types of environments. And so sometimes the, the mores, the norms, the values are, are kind of counter to what the values and the mores and the norms that we will inculcate. Well, we see it in the prison population. It's rampant. It's a crime of opportunity. Um, if, if you don't have a lot of psychosexual differentiation and development, sort of sophistication, um, you resort to what's available, putting it bluntly. It's the only job in the world where your boss is telling you to run towards a bullet or to, you know, put your life in danger in a very direct way. Hey, three o'clock, three o'clock! Maybe that partly that, you know, times of high stress like that and violence around you, something very strange and dark happens. Some people talk about resentment against women being in the military. We don't know the reasons why. Hi, I'm Sergeant Major of the Army, Ray Chandler, and I want to talk to you about sexual assault. Sexual assault is a crime. We cannot trust the military leadership to clean up their own act on this issue. Listen to the victim and take the allegations seriously without asking the victim for details. It has been studied and studied and studied and studied. And they do not contest that it's a serious issue, that the rates are high, that the conviction rates are low. There's not really a debate about the facts. Do not make judgments about the victim or the alleged offender. And there shouldn't be because they keep studying it. What they fail to do is take any action after they've studied it. I think we own this problem, we need to fix this problem. When you give discipline uh, as a commander, you know, you're responsible for everything in that organization, for the safety, the, the welfare, the morale of that unit, and you're responsible for the discipline too. So it's, it's personal between you and that individual that you have to discipline. If you take that out of the hands of the commander, then it's almost disciplined by proxy. It's my hope that the sustained media attention, the lawsuits, the legislative efforts by Jackie Spears and others, continued focus so that we actually get a result. Attention alone will not do it. 
I just recently went to Washington, D.C. to try um, getting a bill passed, the stop bill with um, Congresswoman Spear from California. It's to help our future generation not have the same problems that I had and other people like me, where they can report it and be safe reporting it, not be the ones that, not the ones that get in trouble. I'm opposed to the STOP Act. If somebody comes to me as a commander and says I've been assaulted, I have no choice by DOD policy than to take it to an investigative organization and have it investigated. And those investigators don't work for the individual commanders. I think a lot of people are under the impression they do. They do not. They work through a separate chain. So there's really no conflict of interest there. I try to be fairly grounded um, and realistically this is a problem that has been tackled time and time again in the past. There hasn't been the change that's needed. I mean, I've only been at it about 18 months now, two years. And I think, you know, given we've made a little bit of headway, but there's so much, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take time. Change is going to come from a lot of different directions. It could be that legislation happens first. The military is afraid of like this one extreme wherein they no longer have control of their, you know, the lower level soldiers in the ranks. The other extreme that you can take it to is like, okay, so what if really the, the military can actually act with complete immunity, do whatever they want, not be held accountable for anything that happens to their soldiers or anyone else? I mean, that's also a really frightening thought. How does it affect me? <laughs> Ask my husband. It didn't kill me. It strengthened my faith in God. I don't know if my husband now totally regrets marrying me or what because I'm not as intimate as he would like because I, I can't. I'm on sleeping pills because I have nightmares still to this day about the incidents. Um, I saw a shrink for quite some time and it really helped. Unfortunately, because of a job, I couldn't go as often as she wanted to see me and she ended up dropping me out of the program. So now I'm, I'm on meds, but I get no therapy. Um, so it makes for an interesting life. Have you told your kids about all this? Oh, yeah. 20 year old, when he gets mad at you, throws it in your face. My 17 year old doesn't know how to take it. He still to this day, he's, you know, Dad, don't tell my friends. Well, like, yeah, I'm not going to tell your friends. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, kind of embarrasses him. I can't hold this in no more. This has eaten me alive for so many years, and I've seen what I've destroyed. You know, I got poor relationships with my children because of this. It's not an easy road, but it's helped me because I don't feel as burdened. And knowing what you know now, you would still enter the military? I would still enter the military. Um, would you let your daughter? No, I would never let my daughter. That is the one thing that her father and I have told her because she wants to be a soldier just like her daddy and her mommy. And we told her, no way, you're never going. I don't talk to her about anything that I've been through. Um, she knows that mommy and daddy met in the military, that mommy used to be a soldier, but that's all she knows. And I'd kind of like to keep it that way. I kind of went back to feeling vulnerable, feeling like that little lost American that, you know, I just go on with my life. No one really knows what their true purpose here is, so if you feel something, you gotta go with it. You know, I went in there thinking I was gonna be this hero, I'd change the world. You know, I'd save everything, and then you get there and you realize you're like an ant in 
in a dinosaur world, you know? Uh-huh.